for being so patient. Very much appreciate you. All right, we're going to start in the sermon. So, I want to start this morning by asking you a question. How many of you here have heard the name Yo-Yo Ma before? Yes, you've heard. So, nobody else? A couple of people? All right, so Yo-Yo Ma, I think I've got a picture of him coming up here. Yo-Yo Ma, for anybody who's unfamiliar, Yo-Yo Ma is... Uh, a world-renowned cellist who started his, his musical career as a child prodigy. Started playing when he was four years old, decided his entire career path at four and a half, which I, at that point in time, I wanted to be an astronaut. So the fact that he picked up the cello and he stuck with it, that's very, uh, <laughs> that's admirable. He was educated in some of the finest schools in America, and before the age of 20, he had already performed with some of the most renowned orchestras in the world. Very accomplished. His talents had given him the opportunity not only to perform with these incredible organizations, but it also gave him the opportunity to have offered to him his performance instrument, which is a cello that was crafted in 1733, an Italian cello crafted in 1733, and if you know anything about cellos from 1733, you know they're good. No? Okay, whatever. But this cello is valued, his performance cello is valued at $2.5 million. My wife got mad at me when I bought a guitar. He's been the recipient of numerous reward, uh, sorry, awards, and he currently plays around the world on behalf of the United Nations as a goodwill ambassador. He is widely regarded as a master of his craft and an unrivaled musical genius. And now I bring this up because I want you to imagine this. Imagine for a second that you get an opportunity to go and see Yo-Yo Ma perform live, Carnegie Hall. You get an opportunity to go and see Yo-Yo Ma perform live. And once he gets off the stage, somebody comes up to you and says, we need, we need somebody to follow him up. Imagine being the person who follows up Yo-Yo Ma after a masterful performance. You had better have some good jokes coming up on that stage because you are not outdoing him musically. It's a little bit what I feel like this morning. As we're going into our, into, our, our, uh, into our passage for today, I feel a little bit like I'm trying to follow up an unfollowable act right now. After We're, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 this morning, and if you're familiar with this, this, uh, this part of Scripture, this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So, just to sort of bring us up to speed, we've been spending the first part of this year in a deep dive in Matthew with a specific focus on seeing Jesus as he's revealed in Scripture. Not in the way that we may think that he is revealed, not in the way that our culture likes to think that he's revealed in a lot of ways, not in the ways that our biases and our experiences have colored him to, be, uh, to look like. We want to see Jesus as he's revealed in Scripture so that we can, when we overlay our image of Jesus in our heads, and Jesus, is re he's revealed in Scripture, we want to make sure that those two images match up as much as possible. We're going into Matthew chapter 5 this morning, and like I said, we've been spending the first few weeks of this year in the, in the beginning stages of Matthew, and Matthew up to this point, in this preamble to the gospel, has he spent a lot of time taking great care to frame up who Jesus is, establishing the story of Jesus by establishing his identity, and his qualifications as the, as the Messiah, and we get this, in, and then after all of that preamble, all of that time spent making sure that we know for sure who Jesus is, why he's here, what he's doing. After all that, four chapters of build-up. We come to chapter five, and this incredible three-chunk, or three-chapter chunk of scripture where Jesus just teaches. Just teaches teaches. He puts on a master class in God's kingdom and his law. And by the end of chapter 7, we read that the crowds who heard him were amazed because he spoke with more authority than anybody they had ever heard before. They were stunned by what he had to say. 
So how do you expand on that? As somebody who's coming up here to preach a sermon to you guys, how do you, how do you follow that up? How do you expand on that? How do you follow up the actual incarnation of God as he teaches? I seriously contemplated just standing up here and just reading Matthew 5 through 7 and calling it a day. It would have been long enough. I don't think that's quite what we're here for, though. There's nothing really to add to what Jesus is teaching here. It's pretty clear. At least in my mind, it's pretty clear. But there is an opportunity because of the distance that we have from that Sermon on the Mount, both geographically and time, distance that we have between us and Jesus. I think there's an opportunity here to look at it carefully to be sure that we're hearing his words clearly. I don't want to take anything away from this. I don't think that I can add to it. But I do think that by taking a careful look at it, we can make sure that we are hearing him clearly. Before we get any further, we want to jump right into our passage for this morning. It's Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to be starting at verse 3. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's okay. I'll have it up on the screen behind me. Yeah, we're good. It says this. Jesus teaching to, the, to his disciples here. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. This teaching from Jesus, this is only the beginning, but even just those, just those short verses, this short passage, this is deep and wide stuff. I was talking with a friend this week, and it was in that conversation where we were just talking just about the Beatitudes, this passage that we've just read. We were talking about it, and we we realized as we were talking about it that you could literally spend weeks unpacking these verses. You could study these for a long time and still only scratch the surface, and there may be time for that later. We're not going to get into that with this series. But for today, I want to try and boil down this passage to what I believe is at the heart of Jesus' teaching here, what he's trying to communicate through these Beatitudes, and it's this, the highest value in God's kingdom is a person who knows their need for God. The highest value in God's kingdom is a person who knows their need for him. I want to unpack that together with you. So I want to start by making a comparison. Just a comparison, because Jesus talks about this kingdom of God as he's presenting this. So I want to make a comparison. So when you look at the highest value of our culture, what do you typically see that being? Success? How would you define success? Top dog, dog, fine. Sorry, I did this to kids in youth group for years. You guys can handle this, right? Top dog, we're gonna, well, I'm going to unpack it a little bit more, but I want to give you a chance to respond. How would you think that our culture defines success? Money. Money. Car, you drive. What do all these things symbolize, though? What, like, if you can just bring it back a little bit, what is that money? What is that car? What is, sorry? Materialism or I think that there's even a deeper thing. We're going to unpack that a little bit together, but I don't think that you're wrong here. Our culture is pretty obvious, it's pretty obvious in our culture that we are impressed with people who are able to accumulate wealth, influence, status, and power. Those are the people that we venerate in our culture. We admire people of character, we absolutely admire people of character, people who are honest, people who are humble, people who are wise, we we admire them. But we celebrate and gravitate to people who we regard as successful. 
There are so many examples of this all over the place. If you go to any bookstore or to the library or if you even just look at the movies that are going to be coming out soon, if you go to the biography section of any of these places, you will see that they are jam-packed full of celebrities, business tycoons, and people of influence. Not railing against this, I'm just saying that those are the ones who are there. Our culture, or maybe a better way to f- frame that within the context of our passage for this morning, is, but, is to say that our, the kingdom that we live in, our kingdom is obsessed with success that is measured in power. Am I going to argue with that definition of success? No. No, I'm not going to start getting like weird on semantics here. There's no point in trying to resist the, de- the definition of success that our culture has established. The ability to build wealth, influence, and autonomy, or the ability to determine your own path in life, that is how success is defined. And that's the highest value of this kingdom that we live in, autonomy. That being said, when Jesus describes the people that are blessed in his kingdom, the ones who are the greatest in his kingdom, he speaks to the highest value of his kingdom. Jesus makes it clear that self-sufficiency, that autonomy, is not the highest value in his kingdom. He doesn't speak against it, and he doesn't necessarily condemn it, but he makes it very clear that it's not a high value in his kingdom. In the Beatitudes, Jesus lifts, lists off the most desperate, powerless, humble, and underrepresented people and says that they are the greatest people in his kingdom. Go through that list that we just read through. Go through that list. See how many of those people end up on Forbes. Again, not railing against it, just an observation. See how many of those people end up on the cover of Forbes magazine? The poor, the mourning, the humble, the people in need of righteous justice, the humble, sorry, the merciful, the pure, the peacemakers, and the persecuted. These are people that our culture acknowledges and even tries to lift up in its own way. But these are not the movers and shakers of our kingdom because by our, our definition, they've not achieved the level of success that it takes to have a voice. They haven't achieved the level of success that would grant them a voice. They're not the influential ones in our culture. And here we see how Jesus values, or see how the values of Jesus' kingdom stand in stark contrast to our own. The highest value in the kingdom of God is a person who is acutely aware of their lack of power. The most valued people in God's kingdom are the ones who know their need for Him. There's a flip side to this that we need to take care of first, though, before we go any further. So does this mean that Jesus by going and saying that these people in this passage, these people that he, that he describes, people that we would describe as lowly, does that mean that Jesus hates people who don't fall into those categories? <laughs> That's the obvious answer, right? It doesn't. That, but I think that there are a lot of people who think that he should hate those people. It's actually a fairly popular thing around us right now. There's a slogan going around with young people right now, which is, eat the rich. Has anybody seen this going on recently at all? No? It's okay. It's not a new phrase, but it's something that pops out in certain kinds of protests in certain different areas. This sign that says, eat the rich, and it's not a new phrase. It actually goes all the way back to the French Revolution, and it communicates this idea that radical wealth redistribution needs to occur. It's been gaining traction more recently as people are feeling more and more disenfranchised and they're feeling that there is an unfair distribution of wealth 
alongside this prominent rise of these like mega billionaires that we're seeing right now, guys who get to play with toys in space. Again, not speaking against them, I'm just speaking an opinion that's out there right now. There's this idea that wouldn't it be nice that with, even just with a casual reading of Jesus' words in Scripture, wouldn't it be nice if Jesus maybe sort of supported that idea, that Jesus hated people in power, that Jesus didn't like those people, the idea that being rich is evil? I know certainly I'd be holy in that case. That's not true. Specifically in Matthew 19, we see sort of some evidence for this idea that maybe Jesus doesn't like rich people. We see this, and some people will take this from another encounter that happens later on in Matthew. Matthew 19, there's this story where Jesus has an encounter with a rich young man who has kept the whole law his entire life. He's a good, moral man. And he asks Jesus what it's going to take to achieve, to to go to heaven. What it's going to take to, to come into God's kingdom. And Jesus responds to him, by telling him that in order to be perfect, he needs to sell all of his possessions, give all of his money to the poor, and then follow him. That man walks away with his head hanging low that day because he can't do it. And that story ends with Jesus telling his followers that it's very difficult for a rich man to enter heaven. So, there you go. Jesus says being rich is bad, right? Case closed. Not quite. Not quite. He never said that rich people can't get into heaven. He never said that successful people are not his children. He never said that people who experience those kinds of privileges or those kinds of things, he never said that he's against them. He just said that it's difficult for them to enter heaven. And why? Go back to Matthew 5. You can see it as it's developed throughout this entire Beatitudes statement. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for Him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. I'm going to go into a short illustration before we unpack this anymore. We live by a lake. And thankfully, it stays pretty shallow for a long way off the shore. You can wade out there without really getting into too much danger. When your feet can touch the bottom, the risks of drowning are reduced pretty significantly. However, there are some deep parts out there. And that poses a danger to people who, have, who are not strong swimmers. If a swimmer becomes exhausted or if they start to have trouble remaining ab- ab- above water or if they start to panic, that panic can set in and they may begin to thrash around in a desperate attempt to keep their heads up above the water. It's ultimately useless. But the panic sets in and your, your, their, their limbs just start flailing. In a situation where someone is drowning and there's no lifeguard around, the safest way to approach somebody in that position, somebody who's panicking, the safest way to approach and rescue that person is not to swim out and to grab onto them as they're thrashing. The panic will cause them to grab onto anything solid and they'll pull you under and there's a good chance that the rescuer will become a second victim. It's actually safer for an amateur rescuer to wait until that person tires themselves out and stops struggling before they grab on. Once they have no energy left, they'll stop resisting the rescuer and the rescuer can flip them on their backs and pull them to safety. Jesus' teaching on the value of God's kingdom, Jesus' teaching has a very similar value here. The common thread in the Beatitudes is not that the poor and the humble and the persecuted are better than anybody else. 
He says that they're great, but he doesn't say that they're better than anybody else. It, the common thread is that they are so far from power that they do not resist their need for God. They're so far from their own sustenance. They're so far away from being able to hold themselves up that they, they have no other choice. They reach out and they grab onto God. Jesus didn't speak out against the rich and the Beatitudes, but he does acknowledge that when you are self-sufficient, you are less likely to realize your need for God. You may even resist him like a drowning victim desperately trying to save themselves. The poor, the mourning, the humble, people in need of justice, the merciful, the pure, the peacemakers, and the persecuted are all aware of how helpless they truly are. They don't have anything left. And therefore, they have nothing that would hold them back from totally relying on God. In the story of Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler, we see someone who was good, but who trusted in his wealth and couldn't let go of his power. He couldn't let go of that control. This is my power for self-sustainability. I don't want to let go of it. It stood in the way of completely submitting himself to God. And I would also say that Jesus showed this, shows, sorry, that Jesus showed this uh, wealthy man an opportunity to use his wealth to bless other people. Go sell it and give it to the poor. There is a high calling for people who have abundance to share it with others. So don't hear me saying that we need to hoard it if we have it. Jesus showed this wealthy man an opportunity to use his wealth to bless others, but the main point of that encounter was that the man needed to set his power aside to rely fully on God. This is why Jesus says that the powerless and the needy are blessed. They may not experience physical blessings. As a matter of fact, it may look like they're cursed. But they experience God's blessing. Because to be great in Jesus' kingdom, we need to come to, a, to the same place. We need to come to a place where we are totally reliant on God. I want to take another, I want to take a look at another common thread in the Beatitudes, and that's those blessings. Can't have one without the other. Got this list of people that Jesus sees as so close to God because of their need for him. And then he pronounces this blessing over them. The name of this section, the Beatitudes, is derived from the word blessing or blessed. And each phrase that Jesus speaks with begins, begins with the word God blesses, or if you have a different translation, it says blessed are those. Each category that Jesus mentions, each one of those people that he has in that list he talks about them and then he pronounces a blessing over them. And we see the nature of that blessing in the following verses. So what's the nature of the blessing of God's kingdom? What, what, what can we expect if we're, if we're residents of God's kingdom? If you go through the whole passage again, everything boils down to experiencing that kingdom of God. What does that look like? Talked about this a little bit in... Uh, in our adult Sunday school this morning. If you go back into the Old Testament and if you look at the prophets in the way that they describe God's kingdom, and they do it very often, these visions of God's kingdom coming, when you go back and you see the way that the prophets describe God's kingdom, you'll see a pattern that begins to, to emerge in every description. God's kingdom is always described in terms of abundance, peace, comfort, joy, justice, and a place where God dwells among his people. Not distant, close and intimate. When you look at the nation of Israel and the way that what they were called to, the, the, the law that they were given, the way that they were supposed to be set up, if you look at the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, that is what they were set up to do. They were to be a nation that was totally committed to God's law where he would dwell among them. 
That was the purpose of the law. That was the purpose of the temple. A place that shows God's values and a place where God dwells among his people. God promised a land of abundance. We talked a a while ago about how Jesus says that the entire law and all the prophets are founded on two principles, the love of God and the service for others, love for others. Israel was meant to be God's kingdom on earth, but they never quite got it right. Over and over again, they proved that in their hearts, they did not value their need for God. They valued the things that the people around them valued. They wanted to be like the kingdoms around them. I don't believe that that's an Israelite problem either. If instead of God coming to a man named Abram at that point in time, if he'd instead gone to a guy named Ted, I'm fairly sure we would have had a similar outcome. It's not an Israelite problem. It's a human problem. But with Jesus, we see the unprecedented establishment of God's kingdom. He doesn't just teach about it. He brings it everywhere that he goes. It's exciting and it's fresh and it's alive. His perfect, in his perfect reliance on God, he demonstrates the power of God's kingdom to oppose the effects of sin in the world. The blind and the lame were healed. People were fed. The dead were raised and the hopeless were given hope. And everywhere he went, God dwelt among his people. Everywhere he went, Jesus brought the kingdom with him. And the people who were most receptive to receiving the kingdom were typically the ones who needed it most. I want to leave you with a couple of things as we end our time together today. Just a couple of thoughts to bring with you. And the first one is an encouragement. I want to encourage you with this. Jesus teaches us that when we are in our most desperate hour, when we are at our most desperate hour, we are so close to the kingdom of God. When we are most desperate, that is when we are closest to the kingdom. Life can be difficult. Sometimes it can be beyond difficult. News of sickness or financial problems or even feeling completely powerless to change what's wrong around us. Those things visit all of us. And quite rightly, when we face those kinds of problems, we can feel desperate and powerless. There's nothing wrong with feeling those things. In those times, we are so close to God that we can smell Him. We are so close to the heart of God when we feel desperate and powerless. In those moments when we have no fight left in us and no resources to draw on, we're not doomed to despair. You can cry out to God and you can be assured that he hears you, he loves you, and he has promised you that in his kingdom there is abundance, peace, joy, justice, and his presence as a valued and honored citizen of his kingdom. When we acknowledge our desperate need for God, we are blessed. The second thing is a challenge. Jesus teaches us that the highest value in God's kingdom is a person, is a person who lays down their pride and relies on God for hope, purpose, and provision. And he has promised us that we will experience the blessing of his kingdom. As people, as people who have not earned God's blessing, but received it when we relied on Him, people who haven't earned this, but who have received it like everybody else, we're called to extend that blessing to others. In God's kingdom, the poor are cared for, mourners are comforted, 
the humble lead the way, justice reigns, mercy is valued, purity is honored, weapons are turned into harvest tools. And God, God's approval is supreme. Jesus lived this out everywhere he went. He brought it with him. As we do our best to rely on God for the power to live out his kingdom, let us be quick let us re- be quick to repent when we get it wrong. Let's be quick to recognize the voice of the Spirit in our hearts that tells us when we're getting it wrong. Pride is the number one thing that will keep us and others from the blessings of God's kingdom. Jesus set aside his divine power in the ultimate act of humility. By the power of the Holy Spirit, let's follow his example. Let's be humble. And let's be quick to listen and set our side down, our pride down and admit when we've gotten it wrong, repent, and make every effort to restore the kingdom in places where we've worked against it. When we do that, when we repent and we come back, Stop working against that kingdom. We are given the power to bring the blessings of God's kingdom to the places where those blessings are needed most. Final thought. We're going to continue looking at the Sermon on the Mount for the next few weeks. As we do that, I want to challenge you to remember that Jesus begins his teaching on the, on the mountainside that he begins this teaching by telling us what the highest value of heaven is. Humble reliance on God for everything. As we look at the rest of the chapter, as we look at the rest of chapter 5, 6, and 7, I want to challenge you to keep that in mind as Jesus teaches his followers what it looks like to continue following God. I ask you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, as we come to the end of this, God, I know that I've been convicted throughout this entire week as I've been preparing this, that Lord, I've been shown the places where I've worked against your kingdom. And God, I confess that before you right now. But God, I've also been so encouraged by what you provide. The fact that you've told us that it's not up to us to establish this, that it's only those who realize their intense need for you who are able to build that kingdom. That Jesus, without you, we have no power to bring your kingdom here. That you give us that. That you give us that power to serve. You give us that power to, to witness. You give us that power, God, to serve those people around us. To show your love to them. And we thank you, God, for that provision. That you've invited us to partner with you. in your incredible mission to bring salvation to everyone. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you, God, for the hope that you've provided through your kingdom. And God, as we come to the communion table this morning, again, we just acknowledge what it took to make that happen. Pray, God, that that would strike us and that it would continue to put us into awe and amazement at the incredible love that you have for all of us. Right now in Jesus' name, amen.